Dobson, the extra receiver. Here's the pressure. Pass down the field. And it is intercepted. That is Landon Collins, the rookie out of Alabama, that the ball hit the ground. Second and ten. Thrown away in the direction of LaFell. With 134 to play. Stepping up. And that pass incomplete. One stop by the Giants and the Patriots. Perfect season is over. Greeny from the pocket. He's got the completion to Amendola. Good throw by Brady. To Gronkowski. 45 seconds. Quick throw to the sideline to Dobson for the first down. Here's Brady. And that pass affected by the rush. Brady's got time to find a man, and he does at the 46. Brady, who's thrown for nearly 200 yards in this quarter. Goes to Amendola. That move, a big one. Great move. Caught the Giants that time. They were coming with pressure. Tom Brady got rid of it quickly. And now he spikes it with six seconds. In his career, 16 of 20 beyond 50. 80%. This from 54. Gostowski's kick. And welcome to another edition of the Flying Elvis Faithful. It's your boy Shaq Crosby flying the flag of the Flying Elvis here in the evil city of Gotham. That's New York City. And joining me as always is my past pal, my good buddy from Oklahoma. It's Josh Manson. Josh, how you doing, my friend? Uh, doing good this evening. Uh, glad to be doing the show on a Tuesday. And um, it should be a good one. Got a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah, man. For those of you who are familiar right now we're doing our show at a tuesday night at nine o'clock and that's what we're all going to be doing our show from now on so hopefully a lot of you listeners can tune in and if not you can listen to it on the podcast as you always do so without further ado josh let's get started talking about this giants game because (laughs) it lived up to i mean it wasn't really we didn't really hype it up as much um last week john Dufet did a great job on the show, breaking down this game with us, but <laughs> we all thought it was it was going to be pretty much a laugher, and <laughs> save for I guess maybe the beginning of the game, it wasn't it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> no, it definitely was not what we were expecting, um, and not not surprising, <laughs> actually. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to bounce around a little bit here, Josh, and see if you can follow follow me here. So, all right, first of all, I just have to speak on the team itself. And I mentioned this on last week's show, and I have to mention it again. The the Patriots, this this team is just so – (laughs) Hello? Hello? Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I cut off for just a second. My bad. But anyway, okay. this show, I mean, this Patriots team, has th- this game has shown the grit and the determination of this team. I, I, I just revel in their toughness. I mean, to be able to say that you lost an all-pro linebacker, Jimmy Collins, a Pro Bowl left tackle, Nate Solder, Sebastian Vollmer, your, your, uh, um, your right tackle, and Julian Edelman, a, wide, a Pro Bowl wide receiver, Deion Lewis, of course. Matthew Slater was out. I mean, we always like to see the team healthy because when they're healthy, they're unbeatable. Yet, how many teams can miss six potential Pro Bowlers on the road versus a hated rival and still win the game? I, I mean, the, the determination and the coaching of this team is just amazing. So, Josh, talk about how this team came back from especially losing Julian Allen, which we'll talk about a little bit, and just – the fight and that they've shown throughout the season and especially last week. 
Well, I think the main part is New England does a great job in preparation for these things to happen. I mean, everything Belichick does with this team is to prepare the next guy in case there is an injury like happened with Edelman, which was unfortunate, and Amendola came in and replaced him quite well. I mean, there's definitely a difference between Edelman and Amendola, but talent-wise, Amendola is a good player, so he's able to replace Edelman. You know, pretty pretty good job. I mean, uh, and he's going to have to be the guy to do it for a few, <laughs> quite a few weeks. So um, get used to hearing Amendola's name. Maybe this is where Amendola is the breakout guy in New England and the and, um, heck, he, he might have an increased role in the, like he did last year during the playoffs. So, Amadol is going to do a fine job replacing Edelman, is my opinion. But, um, other injuries, Slater getting hurt in that game. Um, uh, he's a great special teams player, but I'm not really sure, um, if there's going to be, uh, you know, if his loss is going to really affect the team overall other than um, his not being there. But anyways, um, yeah, so go ahead and say your piece. I have to take care of one thing real quick. <laughs> yeah, well, on your point about, and I said we were going to talk about it later, but why don't we talk about it now since and get it out of the way since, again, obviously another big loss, losing Julian Edelman, Okay, look, Rob Gronkowski and Tom Brady are obviously two key players that the Patriots can't live without, but Edelman's absence is just a huge blow to this offense, and this offense relies so heavily on what he's able to do. And coming into Sunday's game, he was the team's leader in receptions. He had 57, and he led all receivers with 34 first downs. And in the short time that he was in Sunday's game, he was targeted five times with four catches, three of which moved the chains. And Sustaining the drives and moving the football is one of the biggest problems that the Patriots had after he left, and they had just seven receiving first downs over the entire second half, and six of which came on their final two possessions. So someone's going to have to step up big in his shoes, and it's, it's obviously going to be Danny Amendola. But Danny Amendola's just been coming on strong since the end of the postseason, and since the early part of this year, he's just been balling out. He's been really, really good, and Sunday was no exception. The fourth quarter, him along with Tom Brady, was, he, both of them were flawless, as you heard in that game-winning drive of the Patriots. They had all five of his uh, – Amendola caught all five of his targets, including a critical fourth-down grab, and kept the drive alive and ultimately allowed Steven Goskowski in position to kick the field goal. And, you know, Danny Amendola took a huge pay cut this offseason because of his reduced role. So he's obviously going to become a bigger part of the offense and pick up the slack. So it, it's very it's very interesting the way, where he's come from, especially his first year where he was ridiculed to, to a degree in which I've never seen a Patriot be ridiculed by people. And I, it was really unfair. And wow. I, just, I just really like this for Danny Amendola. Yeah, you back? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the the big complaint was Amendola, I think, and it was a little justified. He was getting paid quite a bit of money to. He underperformed at first. You have to be you have to be honest about that, and and that's really what the issue was with why people were unhappy with his contract and and um, his performance his first year in New England. So, yeah, and uh, I'm back, obviously. Yeah, and obviously his health was a big reason for the criticism. And But the thing about it was when he pulled the groin, I guess I think it was in the Buffalo game, I think a couple of years ago or last year, he, he yeah. pulled his – he pulled his – hmm? Oh, go ahead. No, I, I'm, I, yeah. I didn't say. Oh, okay, well, yeah, he pulled his groin, and when you do that, and especially as a wide receiver, you lose the explosion, you lose the – emphasis in making those cuts and making those reads, and it's just really hard for you to operate as a wide receiver, especially of that cal- type of caliber. So, sure, yeah, he was he's obviously coming into replacing, I guess, the, mo- the most, 
the, I guess the problem people had was that he was coming in the year that the Patriots had Wes Walker go to the Denver Broncos. But the thing about it is, you know, Danny Amendola was not supposed to replace Wes Walker. That was just a media, you know, type of thing where he wasn't really replacing him. He was just he was just Danny Amendola. He was the best wide receiver out there on the market at that point in time. Patriots got him. They signed him. And, you know, that happened. You know, injuries happened, as we just talked about. But, of course, Danny, Danny Amendola was having a big role. His ascension is going to have to decide another guy who, on this show I've said that I've rooted for him a lot. But, really, Aaron Dobson, his fate is really, is really on the table here. And they're going to need him and Brandon LaFell to produce. So, either Aaron Dobson or Keyshawn Martin is going to be in the battle for playing time. And we also have another wide receiver we have to talk about who the Patriots just put up onto the 53-man roster. We'll talk about that later on when we talk about the Bills. But Aaron Dobson is the preferred choice against um, over Keyshawn Martin because he has the speed and the height that New England needs. And it's the entire reason they drafted him when they took him out of Marshall two years ago. But Injuries have hampered his development, and he's slipping down so far he's just become the odd man out in this offense. And Keyshawn Martin's dealing with a hamstring injury that kept him out of Sunday's game. But he's shown good flashes, obviously, the Jaguars game being the most obvious of those. And But Dawson did make a critical five-yard catch on second and three on New England's final drive that moved the chains and got them near midfield before Amendola helped set up the kick. But... I think Aaron Dobson is really on the hot seat. What do you think, Josh? I think there's another guy that um, that is in the mix that um, probably no one's thinking about is um, Chris Harper. He was promoted back to the team today, and and he played good in preseason, and Belichick talked really highly of him. So don't be shocked if he's involved in some way um, the, that – towards the end of this season. Um, as far as um, Dobson, obviously he <laughs> he hasn't met expectations. So um, it's his, I think this is going to be his last chance. If he doesn't meet expectations, he's probably not going to be on this team next year um, is what I would expect. And, and you mentioned Keisha Marion, and I'm not really sure who's going to be that guy. Um, is it going to be Marion or is it going to be Dobson or is it, or is it somebody we're not even thinking about, like Chris Harper, like I just mentioned? Um, I don't know. I don't. It's probably going to be Dawson. I think he's going to get his his probably his last chance, and if he doesn't meet him, then he probably won't be. He probably won't make it in New England much past this year. Yeah, I was going to talk about Chris Harper later on, but yeah, we might as well do it now. Um, they signed Chris Harper to the 53-man roster from the practice squad, and in addition to that, they released offensive lineman Chris Barker. And I'm really excited for Chris Barker, uh, uh, for Chris Harper. And I, 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 we talked about him in the preseason, and he was really making strides in the preseason. But, you know, numbers – people remember Brandon Gibson. He got injured. So that really – put him in the spotlight in the preseason, especially a game against the New Orleans Saints, which I remember talking about with you, Josh. And he just really made a big statement in that game. So I'm really excited about Chris Harper. Now, I'm not putting him in Canton or anything like that because, no, no, of course, no, he's no, just no. coming up to practice squad. But, yeah. you know, I, I think this is really good depth. I think it was an obvious move to make. And hopefully we'll know more about him in the future. Maybe, of, of course – he has to play, so we'll see what happens right. with him. Going back to the game itself, let's talk about the let's talk about the defense for a little bit. And first of all, we have to give a round of applause to Mr. Malcolm Butler. I mean, he was just amazing. Now, a lot of people are talking about the Odell Beckham Jr long touchdown, and why did Malcolm, why was Malcolm Butler even involved in that? Well, first of all, I don't put any type of blame on Malcolm Butler. I put the blame on Devin McCourty, to be honest with you. And it was more of a product of Devin McCourty taking a bad angle. And that took Butler out of the play and prevented the tackle from being made. But 
overall, Butler kept them in relative check after the 87-yard touchdown catch. Eli Manning targeted Beckham Jr. 12 times, uh, and then Beckham Jr.'s totals are just three catches for 17 yards besides the 87-yard reception. <laughs> it, it's just amazing the way he competed with him. And Old Beckham Jr. acknowledged it as much, especially after the game, if you noticed it. They were, you know, hooking each other up, and they, it was really a battle. So I, I really enjoyed watching him. I, I think Malcolm Butler really did a really good job. This was his best game of the year and his best game as a pro. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, uh, if that 87-yard touchdown by Odell Beckham didn't happen, um, and that wasn't even Butler's fault, that was McCourty's fault because he was supposed to be get him over the, over there. But anyways, uh, amazing performance. He have, and not only that, we should mention what he did on the final play where he knocked it out of Beckham's hand. Well, on the last drive, not final play, but last drive, he knocked out Beckham's hand, uh, preventing a touchdown. And that was probably the biggest moment in the game other than Goskowski's field goal. Um, I, I mean, he, he's been impressive all year. Uh, other than the Antonio Brown game, where Brown pretty had a really good game against Butler, it's been a great year for him. So not surprising. Yeah, he he has really, really impressed me. And I'm sure that learning from Darrell Rivas last year has helped Malcolm Butler a ton, but he's just really, really shown himself up to be a bona fide number one corner in the NFL. And in such a short amount of time, he's done it. So really props to him. Way to go, Malcolm Butler. Did really well. And the fact that he's just a, a, UDF, a UDFA rookie, is a, I mean, excuse me, a UDFA is amazing. And just let this sink in. The, our left tackle is a practice squad player. The right tackle is a backup center. The center is a, is a rookie, an undrafted free agent. The guard, you know, you get the idea. It's just amazing the way that the coaching staff picks up these players and coaches them up. And we talked about this last week with John. It's, the coaching staff, really, I mean, they just do an amazing job. And... Again, it was literally a shutdown performance. Um, also, another guy who I think we've mentioned him four times in the last four weeks, but we have to mention him again, uh, Logan Ryan. People have kind of – he's taken quite a bit of heat earlier in the season, but Sunday, again, another solid outing. Aside from the 31-yard catch he gave up to Ruben Randall, he put together a pretty good performance, and I think he's been better than a lot of people have given him credit for. And one of his best attributes is, like Malcolm Butler, he has a short memory and he bounces right back after giving up a big play. It's like he has amnesia or something, which is, I think it's very important for any defensive back to have that type of an attribute. And he's gotten better. And he already leads the team in interceptions with four. And he almost had another one during one play. I, I think he's been better than a lot of people have hoped for. And a secondary that, you know, prior to this year, you know, everybody, including their mother, was saying, oh, the secondary is going to be hot garbage. But, you know, they've done really, really well. So what do you think about Logan Ryan, Josh? Uh, Logan, I'm a fanboy of Logan Ryan. I think he's been the unsung hero of that defense this year. And I mentioned that a couple times the past couple weeks. Um, I don't I, I mean, he he seems to be like a ball hawk this year. He's got four interceptions, I think. And now he didn't have any in this game, but he definitely was had an impact on the game, and that's what you, what you um, hope for from him. He only gave up three receptions to Reuben Randall um, on four targets, so he was only targeted four times to Reuben Randall, which means that <laughs> Logan Ryan must have been doing some good uh, good work throughout the rest of the game. So, um, There's other guys, too. Um, Justin Coleman played okay. Uh, I had an issue with whoever was covering um, Will Ty <laughs> during this game. <laughs> uh, he seemed to be open a yeah. lot. And uh, Dwayne Harris actually got open quite a few times, too. Yeah, I think that was uh, LaShawn Melvin. I, I think he sucks. I don't like him. 
for some reason. And <laughs> yeah. if I recall correctly, there are two kind of contrasts to the um, – the the, play, the playoff game against the Ravens, I think it was in 2000, uh, 2012 or 2011, where, you know, the year they went to the Super Bowl. And you remember the pass that uh, I think I, Lee Evans, uh, Sterling Moore knocked, knocked the pass away from Lee Evans, which could have been the uh, go-ahead touchdown for the Ravens. And Rashawn Melvin in that game was actually, was actually burnt a few times. <laughs> in that game. So there was a, quite a lot of contrast to that game, which is very interesting. Um, I have to start talking about some of the uh, things that I didn't necessarily like in this game, and one of which was Jamie Collins' absence. And it was very prevalent in this game. And, of course, when you take away any team's best athlete, and it's a huge problem. And the lack of speed in the middle of the field was definitely an issue for the defense. Um, the Giants had a lot of success over the middle, and they didn't have, and not having Jamie Collins in there to deal with their passing game was really something that stood out. And I guess the one thing that Patriots fans can take away from this game, especially considering that they were able to come out there with a win, is but um, Jamie Collins' illness, he apparently has the flu. It's, it, it's apparently had him so sick in recent weeks that he hasn't been able to eat and he's gotten skinny, which is very, very concerning to me. Um and considering that, I think they hoping, – I'm hoping that Collins can regain his strength back and size before putting him back out there because Sunday really reminded us that they really do need Jimmy Collins out there. And hopefully he can come return next Monday against the Bills. But um, what, do you, what did you think – how do you think the Patriots did without Jimmy Collins, Josh? Yeah, I didn't <laughs> – there seemed to be a lot of guys open in the middle of the field. So there was definitely – it was apparent Jamie Collins was on the field. Uh, unless, for any Patriots fan who watches regularly, definitely noticed Collins was on the field. That's what I'll actually say. But um, it's uh, hopefully he does come back. Uh, he's lost weight, as you mentioned, and he's been sick. And and sometimes when you're sick like that, like he's been, then it takes a while to recover. It's not, it's not instant. So um, I think he will be back this week. I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't be at this point. Um, I mean, he, he, if he wasn't, he, then he's been really, really sick, which is not fun stuff. But uh, the fun, uh, we did get to see, uh, had some Gerard Mayo sightings in this game, which was <laughs> not the norm for the year. Um, and, uh, Franey and yeah. Nink- Ninkovich were involved. But, yeah, the middle of the field, uh, the defense part, uh, the guys, Hightower, and uh, I wasn't all that. I mean, Hightower had a good game as far as tackles and all that, but I wasn't all impressed with their coverage. Yeah, I, I, I didn't necessarily like that at all. And a couple other things that I did not like in this game, and I'm possibly not being – that's fair, but I'm just going to qualify this by saying that LeGarrette Blount is not running with his pads as low as he did last year, but I don't know, perhaps that's circumstantial. You know, that was his running style beforehand, although I think it was better than it was when the Patriots first got him. It seems that once he starts to get going, he lowers his pads, but when he's not picking up a hole, he just runs up right and doesn't lean forward. But when the line isn't opening up big holes, he often doesn't do a good job of what little is there. So, it's not a consistent problem, and sometimes the play is just blown up. That <laughs> I guess he realizes that there's nothing else there, and he just gets a yard back or something to the line of scrimmage where things have gotten worse, but I don't know. I know uh, Blount is averaging four-point-something yards a carry, so perhaps that's just a nitpick on my part, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I just think that they need to really – I think he needs to really learn how to fall forward and get that extra yard. And yeah, that's a that's a problem that I have. What do you think? Uh, well, I think he 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 he's not a back who has moves. He he hits a hole, and he and he when he does, he hits it hard. And and there wasn't holes for him. I would say most of this game, and there was a lot. It seemed like he was um, he was running into the back of the offensive lineman because they weren't getting out of his way, but. 
Um, that's partly his fault and partly the offensive line, obviously. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I see it that way. I think Blunt is physical running back and he, and he creates a lot of yards after contact. Um, so I, I'm not sure. He, he, there just wasn't any holes this, in this game to me, the, uh, Shaq, so I don't know. Uh, I think he's had really good games this year, and then games where he hasn't been involved at all. <laughs> yeah, again, it's just a nitpick on my part, but yeah. I, that's, that, I guess that's something I need. I want to see a little bit more. I know he had a, a great game against the uh, Jaguars, I remember, and I know he had a great game against the Redskins a, a week ago, so i just like to see more from Blount because I know – once um, December starts coming around, they're definitely going to need him to do that because we know the – yeah. Well, no, more than ever, they need to establish a run game now that Edelman's out because that's – I think that's going to be really important now. Um, so I think they will, I hope. <laughs> and get James White involved too or whoever, Brandon Bolden, one of those two guys. Yeah. And let me see what else I want to talk about. Uh, let me see. I know there's more I wanted to talk about about the team. Oh, right. Scott Chandler. Um, each week, more and more, it seems like he's evolving, becoming more in the offense. So, But the thing about it is with Scott Chandler, it's, it's just so funny that he owned the Patriots when he was a Buffalo Bill. And mm-hmm. he caught, it seemed like he caught everything in sight against the Patriots. But I guess that one uh, – there's been a couple of drops this year where he just really has the ball and he can catch them. But I don't know. He's just, just something about it that I just don't like about Tanner. I thought he would be a pretty big weapon for us, actually, but I guess I'm wrong. I mean, the drop ball when he was wide open, it's just been that kind of a season. He makes good plays and he screws up on other ones. So it's, it's I just find that really interesting that the way the way that – Scott Chandler used to play against the Patriots, and that's probably why they picked him up. But we'll see. Maybe once, maybe another. He's another guy that I think needs to step up. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, he needs to step up. But um, I don't know. <laughs> he hasn't played good this year, as you were alluding to, and and he did get a touchdown catch in this game. Um, but he was targeted three times, and he dropped one, as you said. Uh, he hasn't really been all that good for us yet, and it's kind of surprising because, like you said, he he has always been a Patriot killer when he was in Buffalo. Um, <laughs> so uh, Belichick's philosophy has always been to sign guys who always play good against him, like we did with Welker and uh, um, I, Rodney Harrison maybe and some other guys I'm forgetting about, I'm sure. Um yeah, Chandler hasn't panned out yet, but maybe um, down the stretch he will be more involved. All right, and before I uh, before we talk about him, I'm going to play two uh, clips. And another guy who I'm kind of pissed off about is Deron Harmon, although it's just this is kind of a playful pissed off at this from me. Um, <laughs> he chipped Danny Amendola as he was returning the uh, – was it a kickoff or was it a punt return? It was a punt I return. A, I think it was a punt return, yeah. So he, he shook them off. He could have went all the way, but here it is anyway. Australia went to high school in Baton Rouge and on to LSU. And Damon Dolan breaking free from two tackles and getting to the outside. Damon Dola gets past wing and... Breaks another tackle. I do not see a flag. But at the end, he falls at the seven. Did he get tripped by his own guy? It looked like he was going in to score. I was looking for a flag. Everything was clean at the other end. Watch the block that's coming up. Against Hertzlick, 94. Yeah, I was checking that out, but yeah, it's fine. Thought it could have been too low, but it wasn't. Did not go out of bounds. Got a little off balance, shook it off. Oh, hey, he yep. tripped up over Thought one so. of his own teammates. It was Harmon. Yeah, poor, poor the wrong Harmon. <laughs> <laughs> that was a 
I was really upset when that happened. I was like, what in the world? Because we, uh, we, I was worried we weren't going to get in the end zone after that happened. <laughs> yeah, then they had what? Was that when Brady threw the interception? Or no, did they no, score? No, no. I think that. they scored, no, right? They, they got a t- Blunt got a touchdown on that drive. Okay. Yeah, but there was there was one, I think it was one drive where Brady just had a horrible interception. And, and yeah, that's I think it was the drive. The, the LaFell one? Yeah, that was a drive where New England got in the end zone, they got flagged for holding, and then on the second uh, second down, Brady threw an interception. Yeah, a bad I normally don't. <laughs> yeah, I normally don't blame the ref for anything. I don't like to do that, but Ed Hockley, he's just just such a drama king. That's all. That's all I'll say about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Go ahead. Oh. Well, well, one more thing before I um before we move on to talking about another bunch of craziness uh, involving fans being butthurt about the Patriots winning a game. Steven Goskowski, we must talk about him because he, the dude is just a special, special player. And not to toot my own horn, but beep, beep, we talked about special teams in depth last week, and I said it was going to be very important. And lo and behold, it was. It, I mean, just think about how hard – it has to be to imagine replacing a one clutch kicker with another one. And it's so seamless. And that's exactly what the Patriots have somehow managed to do, which they've managed to slip, in, let's slip them in right under Adam Vinatieri. And for the past 15 years, the Patriots have had pretty dominant kicks. And it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> He's brilliant. And the game winning kick that he had from 54 yards out, it was, I think it's obvious, it's obviously one of the biggest field goals that he's made during his 10-year career here. And the funny thing about it is he said after the game that one of the things that keeps him calm is the fact that he sings a song in his head to keep him loose. But whatever he's been doing, he's a guy who Patriots fans should be singing his plays, praises with after just seeing how consistent he's continued to be. And guys like him don't come around very often. And take into account the fact that how many kickers are seeing their tent sail wide this season. He's quietly reaching the point where it's fair to finally consider him as the best in the game, period, given what he's accomplished over his career. And, you know, there's been debate about who's better, Goskowski or Adam Vinatieri. But to me, it's right now, in 2015, there's no question it's Goskowski. Now, Adam Vinatieri is probably going to go to the Hall of Fame, Sure about that, of course, because he's made a lot bigger kicks. But Goskowski is just the better kicker right now. There's no debate about it. Josh, what do you think? Well, Goskowski is probably going to be in the Hall of Fame as well. Um, actually, I I would say career-wise, Goskowski is a better field goal kicker than Vinatieri ever was in New England. <laughs> to be honest, Vinatieri was great. Don't get me wrong; he made clutch kicks, but. Uh, people forget certain events, like in the Super Bowl against the Panthers. He missed two field goals in that game. He just happened to be um, the guy who got the last shot at it, and that's what people remember. Um, but Goskowski is 17 from 21 from 50 yards out in his career. He's 3 of 5 from 54 yards bat and back. So, I mean, that's ridiculous. There's not anyone even close to that. Um, so, yeah, Goskowski is the best field goal kicker in the league. It's not even a question. But since we're talking about special teams, I want to give a shout-out to another guy in our special teams who probably doesn't get much recognition, and that's Ryan Allen, who had some really great hit, uh, punts in this game. Uh, he averaged 50 yards of punt, 200 yards total, and um, had one inside the 20. That was a pretty big deal. So uh, good on him, too. So and then we mentioned last week that um, we thought that one of our um, Edelman or Amdola was going to have a good return at least once in this game. And it, sure enough, um, there was one that should have been a touchdown, but obviously we already mentioned why that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. So um, just, just really good, really good special season. Um, I don't know if you saw this, Josh, 
But um, there was a video on Twitter. Uh, JetBlue is the official airline of the New England Patriots, and from a flight from Orlando to Boston, there was they were playing the Patriots game as it was going on, and here's their reaction as Gostowski nails the winning kick. Yeah, so everybody was happy about that. So that was good. Yeah, I saw that. That was a cool video. (laughs) Yeah, that was awesome. So um, quickly, let's – well, we talked about the Julian Edelman injury uh, briefly, but let's um, let's say what exactly it is. Uh, There were reports that came out an hour after the game that – the injury was to his fifth metatarsal, which is believed to be a true Jones fracture, which is really inside of the broken foot. And reports came out that he could be back before the season is over, hopefully uh, before the playoffs start. And obviously a bad, bad, bad thing to happen for the Patriots offense. And it's a really key blow. And, I, you know, it's it's this – this is the only thing that I think that can keep this team from winning the Super Bowl is injuries like these. And they, as they always do, they're going to have to come come up and the next man up is going to have to step up. So, so we talk, we've talked about it often. So we'll see what happens. There's a lot of other guys to step up, and we'll see what happens with that. Um, before we move on, I uh, do want to mention something that's really sad and – but we have to mention it because um, Nate Solder uh, announced on uh, Twitter that his uh, infant son, Hudson, has kidney cancer, and he's completed a few rounds of chemotherapy already. And, I mean, there's just some things that definitely leave you wondering about how unfair life is. And Monday night was definitely one of those nights, I'm sure, for Nate. And it's it's just very tough news, especially – when that when cancer it's cancer is, is a is a bitch alone, but when it hits children, it really it really I don't know. It's just really sad. And obviously, our thoughts and prayers go out to both the Solder family and to Hudson. And Nate Solder posted a thank you and post, posted a picture of his son, which is, which is so cute in the hospital already. And he he's just amazing, and I and it's kind of it's kind of a good thing that Nate Solder now is out for the year, so he can take care of his son, which is obviously the most important thing. So, uh, Josh, what do you have to say about this? I can only say what you said that it's unfair when a child gets cancer, and and I hope for the best for him. That's that's really all I can say on it. I mean. Uh, I don't deal good with these types of situations, to be honest with you. So I, I'm fortunate to say I have never had anyone in my family directly have cancer, and most people can't say that. But um, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, nonetheless, even still. Hello? No, it's, it's – yeah, it's – no, it's just a – I'm just shaking my head because I just hate that – Children have to deal with this. I mean, that that's the – like, nobody should have to deal with it, period. But, I mean, especially when it's children who don't ask for anything. They're just living their lives, and, you know, this happens. So God bless the Solder family. May, may God keep them and a quick recovery at, or out of this. They, they, Nate got out of that last year. He survived. So God willing that his son will as well. All right, so let's make things a little, well, maybe not necessarily lighter, but Josh, I think you had something to talk about in regards to Coach Belichick. Yes, Coach Belichick. Uh, there's some people who are complaining about him not wearing a military themed uh, pin that the coach has been wearing in the headset. He's not been using the. B- BDU color, or Army color, whatever you want to associate it with. Um, 
headset. So, and I'm not sure how I feel on it because to me, I, if I feel like probably something he should be doing, to be honest with you, and I don't know what your feelings on it, but if everyone else in the NFL, I don't, I don't understand why he's doing it, especially during times like this. But I do know to his defense, Belichick has donated so much to na- the Navy as far as um, the Naval Academy, more specifically, um, something to do with the library, I think I read. And he's done so much, and he's hardcore military guy. So I'm not sure that he really needs to prove his loyalty to the military because he is very hardcore military guy. He's very involved. His dad was in the Navy. It's so... But I do feel like maybe he should, you know, show his support during football games too, like other coaches. But I don't know. I think it's just another way for uh, people to complain about the Patriots in a way. (laughs) Well, I I acquiesce to to you, Josh, since you served in the military. So, you know, if you feel that he should uh, in some way show support, as far as visually, then I, I think he should too because, I mean, I'm sure there are camouflage hoodies available that has his, his logo on it that he can make. So there's, there's always a way to show your support for your troops. So I think he should do that. But as you said, his family is all military, Wesleyan, Navy, and all that. So I, I think he knows where his heart lies as far as the military is concerned. But, yeah, absolutely. If you're going to, you know, be a part of the league, at least show that type of effort to make that. But it's, I don't think it's – for me, I don't think it's necessarily that big of a deal, whatever he wears. You know, I think my concern is, you know, co- coaching the team to another championship. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, All right. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So – and uh, – one last thing about this game, and it's just another person, and I have to play this because it's just another person who's living in the Twilight Zone. Uh oh. Yeah, it's just another person. Uh, Daily Snark posted this explanation of the of the um, of an incident where. This is, this is a New York Giants fan, by the way. So just let me just preface that. Uh, they're calling conspiracy through a video that was posted on YouTube that claims that the Patriots received extra time to kick the winning field goal, which is in that video. So I'm not even going to read that. I mean, there have been multiple occurrences of clock malfunctions already in this NFL season, but the argument that protects the Patriots is that the Giants called a timeout right before the kick. So – Therefore, by rule, the play clock was reset to 25 seconds because the ball wasn't set again. The rule states that you have a guaranteed 25-second minimum of the full 40 of play clock after the ball is set, which it was following the timeout. But, you know, regardless of these people's accusations, the comeback win was very entertaining, and the NFL is not investigating. So, I mean, (laughs) this guy's a moron, to be honest with you. (laughs) What do you think, well, Josh? Well, the, this is my opinion, and it's really simple. The game was in New York. <laughs> so if there was a clock malfunction, blame your own 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 uh, team. I mean, they're in control right. of the clock. <laughs> so that's it. I mean, how could New England right. be involved? <laughs> right. How could they pull it off? Uh, Ed Hockley, clearly from the calls that he made, he's not a Patriots fan. <laughs> so, you know, but um, the clock operator is – hired by the National Football League. So, yeah. I mean, it's honestly, the more crap that I see posted on social media and YouTube, the more I just begin to feel like I, I'm an old geezer, even though I'm 26 years old. I mean, I, I'm, I'm ready to throw it all in the dumpster and just go back to, you know, the times, maybe like in the early 90s or something, where every silly person and every silly opinion was limited to that silly person, you know, where – you know, the friends and anyone else that was around him, not for the world to see, hear, or spread as to be taken seriously because people are just too stupid to check sources and fact check, you know, as, you know, real journalists do. 
it's just penetrated society. Not to get on a, a rant or anything like that, but you know, I just, I just, I just hate YouTube and I hate the internet for things like that. But whatever, we'll move on. Let's let the let the haters hate because why? They hate us because they hate us. Okay, so now Josh, let's talk about these Buffalo Bills and. First, I want to talk about the Patriots' offense going against the Buffalo Bills' defense. And I think the Patriots' wide receivers, we talked about it with Rob Gronkowski and all that, but I'm just curious what you think on how the Patriots are going to spread the Buffalo Bills out. I, do you think that they're going to run the football? Because I don't think they're going to. No, I think this is going to be a pass-heavy uh, game. Um, and I think we're going to see Amendola definitely be involved. <laughs> Probably a lot of catches from Amendola because Edelman was very much involved in the week two, and and I just see the same from Amendola as well. And then Gronkowski had a big game against Buffalo in week two, so you're going to see a lot of Gronkowski, uh, Edelman, and now that Brendan LaFell's back, I think that adds another element that wasn't there in week two. Um, uh, he's, uh, I guess I'd call a fellow, a, a, a guy that is, I don't know. He's, he plays a lot of downfield and sometimes he plays some short plays, but I think he opens up the offense downfield for New England. So we'll see, we'll see that from New England. And I, I expect Brady to have, you know, quite a few passing yards. He had 400 something in, in week two and uh, he threw almost 60 times. So. Um, I look forward to that. Yeah, he had 466 yards passing last on um, week two. So I think that he's going to have a pretty darn good, uh, <laughs> maybe not equal that but because of the offensive line, but I'm pretty sure he's going to drop, drop back at least 40 times because uh, the Patriots running the football, well, I mean, why? I mean, with the Garrett Ball, I mean, with Deion Lewis being out for the season, I mean, that, takes away their uh, option of third time back. But they still do have light, which I think that they should focus on giving the ball to him as well. But as far as Danny Amendola, obviously we talked about him earlier. I think Danny Amendola is probably going to be a big part of this game. He may have probably eight receptions, hundred something yards, maybe even a touchdown. But, yeah, with Kyle Williams being out, I think that's going to have have a real big impact on the way the Patriots offensive line plays their guys and the way Brady releases the ball because I think that last the last time they played the Bills, Brady was releasing the ball, I think, under two seconds. So that may not happen again with the state of the offensive line, but I think that's going to be a big part of it. Yeah, uh, it, it should be interesting. I, I don't know. I, I, Brady, look, New England is going to pass the ball a lot. That's really how what I'll leave it at. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's talk about the Buffalo Bills and their offense going against the Patriots defense. I think that the matchup to watch again is Sammy Watkins versus Malcolm Butler. I think he's going to do really well against him because – I mean, the way he's proven to play against the best, he's passed with flying colors. He did it with Antonio Brown in the first game of the year. He did it with Odell Beckham Jr. last week. And, you know, Sammy Watkins is obviously a tier below both of those guys, maybe even two tiers below. So I think he's not going to have a problem shutting him down. Um, And then after that, there's not a lot of other guys to go to as far as passing the football with Tyrod Taylor, and I mentioned Tyrod Taylor because he's actually pretty surprising. He's actually number three in terms of quarterback completion percentage, uh, quarterback passer rating, excuse me. Brady has 111 passer rating, and Tyrod Taylor is actually third with 106.2. So, yeah, Tyrod Taylor is actually, has actually played pretty well, but I don't think he has a lot of options to go to as far as throwing the football. And I think the Patriots secondary, we mentioned Logan Ryan, uh, Devin McCourty, I think he will rebound from, I don't think he had a pretty, I don't think he had a banner game last week. 
So, and again, Malcolm Butler doing what he does. Patrick Chung as well, the entire secondary, I think, has really been a star and not what people thought in the beginning of the year. So what do you think about Tyrod Taylor and the, and the Bills wide receivers? Well, Tyrod Taylor has had an excellent year, and I uh, can't knock him for that. And and he adds an element to Buffalo that they haven't had in years past. And and he he gave New England troubles in week two. Now he threw three picks. He was picked off three times. But overall, uh, Tyrod Taylor has been one of the best quarterbacks over the past month. So he's been playing good, but I love what our secondary is doing too. So I don't, I don't see – much passing yards. I think New England can shut down for the most part uh, the offense, uh, the passing offense of the Buffalo Bills. Uh, the guys out of the backfield are what worry me. Obviously, um, with New England's defense, um, McCoy's good out of the backfield catching the ball. So, and McCoy's been playing really good. But I think you're about to mention the run game, so I'll let you go first on that. Yeah, LaShawn McCoy, who's actually been playing pretty well this past these past uh, months. He's actually been the focal point of the offense, as well as Carlos Williams, who has scored a touchdown, I think, in every game that he's played, six or seven of those games. He's just been absolutely, absolutely excellent. And we know a Buffalo Bills fan who loves Carlos Williams. He's loved him since he came out from Florida State and he was big and strong and really gave the Patriots problems in week two. So I think this might be where the Bills have an edge. We talked about it last week with the Giants. and They didn't really attempt to run the football, but uh, I think the Bills will try to establish a run. I think that might be their best chance to win the game, to run it with LaShawn McCoy and Carlos Williams. So what do you think about the Bills and their running attack? Uh, it's talented. Carlos Williams – like you said, tied the record with six straight games um, in a career for with a touchdown. Um, that's a, that's that's amazing, and he he's shown up whenever he's been given a chance. And then McCoy has been crazy good lately. So um, uh, our defense is ranked high, as um, ranked one number one overall against the run, but. I'm not sure I'm buying all the stats because I don't think there's a lot of reasons that I don't believe it. For one, New England's ahead a lot, and that takes away the run game. But also, I don't really think New England's played a team with a great running back this year overall. So, um, I don't know. I I don't see – well, what I actually see is uh, Buffalo trying to establish a run game. And and New England has definitely shown me some things where the – with quarterbacks that are, can scramble, I, I think New England's struggled with with that type of quarterback as well. I don't know if you agree with me on that, but that's definitely been one of the, my complaints with New England is quarterbacks who can scramble with the football they seem to struggle against. Yeah, I agree. They've struggled with those types of quarterbacks for a while now. Uh, a game that comes to mind that really emphasizes that is the game against uh, Cam Newton and the Panthers, and you guys remember that game ending with, you know, the phantom P.I. call against Rob Gronkowski, and, you know, he, they really had a tough time stopping Cam Newton out of the out of the eye, especially when he was run and move and juke and do things that Cam Newton does. Yeah, they have a problem with that. So Tyrod Taylor, he isn't one of those guys. He isn't definitely isn't as big and strong as Cam Newton is. But, yeah, they do have their problems with him, with guys like that. But I don't think it's really going to be much of an issue. It wasn't really that much in week two. uh, But it it was in the second half, at least, but not to the point where it was a danger. Maybe at the end of the game it was, but not not for the full extent of the game. Uh, Yeah, so all right, Josh, what do you think? Let's predict the score. Um, I will say the score will be 32-17. New England will win. Yeah. See, the thing about it last time, week two, was, you know, you know how Rex Ryan is. He got his team all fired up. He got the fans all fired up. They put the 1-0 and billboard up. They got, you know, they thought it was their Super Bowl. I'm pretty sure the same thing is going to be the case 
this week, you know, they're going into enemy territory, blah, 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 blah. But I think they're in, they're going to be in Mecca. They're going to be at Gillette Stadium. And this is a game where the Patriots, they, they do obviously well all the time, but these are the games that they win going away. And I think that this game is not going to be an exception, especially even though the Patriots offensive line obviously – is in shambles. I think they hope to get a lot of these guys back, uh, Cannon and Vollmer being two names. And I think the Patriots are going to win 30, let me see, 34 to 17. Yeah, I think that's a good score, 34 to 17. Sounds good to me. So, all right, getting down to the wire here on the show. And, of course, you know what that means. It's time to laugh at our opponents and our rivals and the people who hate the Patriots. It's, that's right. It's time for the Patriots moment of Zen. And there's a lot to talk about on this segment. First, we have to talk about the teams who have actually helped the Patriots with their ineptitude this past week. And one of them being so inept that <laughs> – well, actually, we can choose which, one I'm, which team I'm talking about, but I have to play uh, something that I think Patriots fans will enjoy. Here we go. Two weeks, the Broncos have converted 50% on third down. Omaha! Manning going deep and is intercepted midfield. Picked off by Marcus Peters. And is out of bounds on the far side of the field. Peters in there. Manning on second and ten. And this pass is intercepted. Picked off by Sean Smith. Sean Smith down at about midfield. And once again, Manning is picked. It appears as if Emmanuel Sanders loses his footing as he's trying to come back to the ball. Either that or Sean Smith climbs over the top of him and just takes the ball away. Sanders here on the top. Smith is over the top of him, and you're going to see on this curl, he tries to come back, and Sean Smith comes right over the top of him and is able to get that interception. Doesn't look like Emmanuel Sanders had very good footing coming out of the, the cut. He was stumbling a little bit. Sean Smith able to come up with a, with a big interception and put the ball at midfield. He messed it before the level. C.J. Anderson is in the backfield. Takes on a blitzer, and the pass is intercepted. Picked off by Josh Maga. And Maga out of bounds inside the 25-yard line. Manning came into this game leading the NFL in interceptions thrown with 13. He has added three today. Well, and Peyton Manning gets fooled. Maga on the backside here is going to float back into this area, and he's the one that's going to get the interception, trying to get Demarius Thomas on that in cut at about 15 yards, and Maga floats right into where Manning is trying to throw the ball and comes up with the third interception of the day of Peyton Manning. And you know, <laughs> Omaha. <laughs> no, but seriously, I mean, it's really. And then he was prior, prior after that, he was benched for Brock Osweiler, who actually looked pretty darn good. Maybe not necessarily, maybe not Manning wide, but yeah, it's really sad to see him deteriorate, deteriorating like this. And uh, I obviously, as a Patriots fan, I don't like Peyton Manning, but I got to acknowledge he's. A, a darn, he's always been a darn good quarterback, and it's it's really sad to see him like this. But you know, the Broncos losing that game that obviously was a big thing for the Patriots because the Patriots play the Broncos next week, and we're gonna have Petey Bronco on next week to talk about this game, which is going to be very it's going to be very exciting, and we'll see what happens on that front, but. Well, another team that helped the Patriots was last night was the, was the Cincinnati Bengals. And that loss I was not expecting at all. That was a pleasant surprise to see the Texans really – both teams did not look very good in that game. But the Bengals looked worse, <laughs> you know, not, not to, and to say that they looked worse, it was really nothing. It was like 10 to 6 or 10 to 7 in the fourth quarter. And that's that's a very significant loss for 
the Bengals. So the Patriots are one of only two teams that are unbeaten, along with the Carolina Panthers. And it just really goes to sh- – and I just – well, I'll give my opinion after you do, Josh. But, Josh, go ahead and just talk about these teams helping out the Patriots. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean that's awesome. Uh, this is a rough week for – uh, the favorites all, all throughout the NFL, to be honest with you. Um, and Houston was probably one of the biggest surprises of the week. And 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 the best part of that one was it's an AFC loss, not just a loss. So that actually helps with tiebreakers as well, even more. So that's a big win uh, for New England, actually. And um, New England could potentially... Uh, lock up a playoff spot in week 12 from what I'm reading. So uh, a lot of things would have to go right. But uh, so the possibility is there, though. So And uh, Manning, as far as Manning goes, uh, see, I, I don't know. I feel bad for him, to be honest with you. I think he should have hung it up when he had, uh, last year, uh, to be honest. But he reminds me of a guy who just isn't going <laughs> to – I guess he just is going to be that guy who goes out when things are rock bottom, I guess, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, I guess all of this talk about, you know, seeds and stuff is premature, given the fact that we're barely halfway through the month of November. But it just goes to show how important each one of these games are going to be over the last final stretch as the top teams in the conference are going to start to begin jockeying for playoff positioning. So, all the Patriots have to do is to continue to win, and they'll guarantee themselves a top spot. And obviously, if they win on Monday night, I think the AFC East is pretty much over with. Consider, well, uh, of course, there is a game against the Jets at MetLife Stadium to still happen. But pretty much, they've, I think if they, they win on Monday night, they've pretty much locked the AFC East. And if they win against the Broncos, there's not that many more. I'm not saying that there are any cupcakes left in the schedule, but I think most of the games are winnable. And I'm not going to start about the undefeated talk. I don't. Just one game at a time. That's how we. That's how we do here at Patriots Nation. But <laughs> the way if the Patriots can keep winning, they'll keep themselves in the driver's seat. Right now, they're number one in the AFC as far as top seeds are concerned. So, and that would be very important. As, again, with all these injuries happening, I think the, a buy more than anything, is the most important. Home field advantage, sure, that would be, that'd be wonderful so the Patriots wouldn't have to go anywhere to do anything. So I think home field would be great, but a first-round buy is, I think, what the team should really be focusing on the most. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, the first-round buy would actually come in to play more – with Edelman, um, his injury, because they're saying six to eight weeks. So if we get a bye, then he might be able to be come back after the bye week. So Yeah, so obviously there's seven, eight games more to go. So we'll see what happens. This is a long season, folks. Don't, don't, don't put yourself in a bind here. You've got to pay attention to everything that's going to happen. It's going to start off on Monday night against the Buffalo Bills. So, yep, we'll see. All right, Josh, that's about it for us, man. Uh, good show. Uh, I had fun. Yes, sir. I had a great time. And next week we're going to have even more fun because, like I said, PD Bronco is going to be here. Hopefully, maybe we'll even get Jerome Butler in here, uh, Raider, a.k.a. Raider Rome, to <laughs> moderate because I'm going to be also going to be on the West Recess coming up next Wednesday, but that's not this Wednesday. But uh, we'll be talking about the Broncos game in depth against the Patriots. That's obviously going to be a marquee game. Just We didn't think the Patriots-Giants game would be a marquee game, but it ended up being that way. But this is definitely going to be a marquee game. It's on Sunday Night Football. So that's going to be a very, very, very big game. So we're going to have to obviously go big here at NGSC, and we're definitely going to do that. But in the meantime... Josh and Jerome are going to be on the NGSC West Recess tomorrow night at 11 p.m. right here on NGSC Sports. So you make sure you listen to them. They're going to have they're going to break down everything that happened in Week 10 of the NFL season in the West and a whole lot more. So you make sure you listen to 
Jerome, and Josh on the NGSC West Recess, 8 p.m. Western Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure you listen to that. And Jerome's other show, The Black Hole Brigade with Jim Pasquitz, you can also listen to that Friday nights at 9.30 here on NGSC. And we'll be back here Tuesday night at 9 p.m. right here on NGSC, The Flying of His Faithful. We'll talk about the Bills game. And, of course, we'll have Petey Bronco, like I said. So, oh, make sure you visit our Facebook page. Our Facebook page is doing excellent. Thank you all so much for clicking on and liking the page and liking what we got to say and what the articles we're sharing. You guys are really killing it as far as listening well, and listening to the show and looking at our page. This past month has just been amazing. So thank you all so much for clicking on. Patriots Nation, you're showing up and showing out. So we really appreciate it. So make sure you continue to listen. So we're going to continue to do it. So for Josh, I'm Shaq. Love, peace, and go Pats. Good night.